This video is supported by EmuDB, the lightweight, high-speed immutable database for systems and applications. Hello everybody and welcome back to the Moshix mainframe channel. This is Moshix. In the beginning there was the ASCII character set and everything was good. Then in the last 15 years or so we've seriously started to switch to expanded or extended character sets such as the UTF character set system which allows for national uh, alphabets and national writing systems to be used on uh, modern computing. However, if you've done any work on uh, on mainframes, and I assume you have because you're visiting this channel, then uh, you may have encountered here and there some very strange character sets which we're not used to in the ASCII world or UTF world even. Uh, for instance, um, I have here a PL1 program I cut out all the stuff that's not important, we'll look at it later, but you have here an expression uh, if count or a condition, if count, and then the strange character here, what is that? If count something, zero, then do. What does it mean? Um, obviously this wouldn't be if count is equal zero because then uh, this wouldn't make sense. What this means in PL1 and the PL1 programming language is not. That's a logical operator for not. So if count is not zero, then do this. Now uh, in PL1 you use this for the uh, no, uh, or uh, sorry, for the not uh, uh, operator. And there's some other languages such as Rex that use similar. Um, in fact, Rex is based, was meant to be based on the PL1 syntax to a big extent, but uh, Rex uses also a similar not operator and some other languages uh, and some other characters and signs exist in the mainframe world that we are not used to see in the computer world that we've known for the last 34 years, starting with the DOS PCs and, and, uh, and later on. So uh, this video is about the thing with the Epsidic character set because this is an Epsidic sign that's that is exists on the mainframe and is an important sign on the mainframe that we're not used to. And so um, I thought that we use this video to to look a little bit at what this thing is with Epsidic and how it came to be that we have such uh, diverse important character sets still in use today. Before I go there, there I just uh, promised to show you the rest of the program. This is my Queen's uh, and Queen's calculation program that I've been using extensively in this channel for all kinds of purposes. So if I show you the rest of the program, this just calculates um, how to place Queen's on the chessboard of n times n size so that no Queen can uh, attack the other. And um, so I just put in here this condition that if the count uh, found, so if, if there was in, if some solutions indeed were found, uh, then print them out. If they're not found, then, uh, then don't print them out. And so um, we can run this program and see what happens. Submit. We're obviously on COS here. So this is job 2301. And this already ended with max condition code 12. Oh, that's a surprise. Let's go find out what happened. What is the problem? So we're looking here at the PL1 compiler output. Okay, doesn't it doesn't like the external variable, so let's go. I think he wants it like this. Let's try again. Oops. Jobs twenty job twenty three zero two. And that went better. Let's go look at the output. And if you go to the bottom, yeah, so for a chessboard size of ten times ten squares it found 724 solutions. Now, uh, this condition here just says that if no, if no solutions were found, don't print anything. And I just put it here just for the purpose of this video. Now, how did we get from a, you know, I'm, I'm obviously recording this on a, on a Windows computer, 
as you can see from the background maybe here or the guy here a little guy climbing on the wall and um, and we live you know in, in, a, in a modern windows computer we live in an ascii or utf world if you do pure text then it's obviously uh, then it's obviously uh, text or ascii or if you do something more fancy then it's going to be stored in utf format how do we get from that to epsidic and this video is about the story of epsidic computers were used mainly as very fast calculators and so characters were a second or even a third priority in fact for instance in until the uh, early 70s 73 74 in the soviet union for instance even ibm s360 and s370 compatible computers they had very poor quality uh, uh, peripherals and the printers for instance were very often we're only able to print numbers and not even print characters at all so and uh, of course the same here in the in the western world uh, uh, characters and and alphabets were added much much later to computers in the first 10 15 years uh, maybe even more slightly more characters were were just not a priority and if characters were used uh, for printing or for even for uh, programming they were usually uppercase only and sometimes they were 5-bit character sets um, some were 6-bit character sets and those were out of uh, generally computers in the beginning was 36 bits uh, why 36 bits because 36 bits is a good um, is a good bit size for calculations of uh, for instance for uh, log tables uh, um, logarithmic tables were uh, were calculated heavily in the beginning with computers for all kinds of purposes and the amount of, uh, of the significant uh, numbers being behind the comma um, that were important resulted in computers needing about 36 bits of uh, of compute of compute size so in in 1960 uh, the U.S. was always leading in, or often leads in uh, standards, and so uh, an American standard uh, was created for called the American Standard Code for Information Interchange, or ASCII, and uh, surprisingly, one of the of the firms uh, standing behind this new standard at the creation at the beginning was IBM, um, but. Um, The reason ASCII was created was that sorting of punch cards and records was was the main idea behind it. So, um, and uh, the space character was often used to display numbers, so was or to separate numbers. So it was often placed ahead of the alphabet, and that's why one of the reasons why we have the space at the beginning in the ASCII sign. So you can see that a lot of the things we take for granted today actually have. Have a have at the beginning of the origin within the mainframe world of the 50s and uh, 60s. So the space character was used to display numbers um, or as a placeholder for numbers. And uh, upper and lower cap was decided to not intersperse them. So uh, lower cap A and and uppercase A were not following each other. They were completely separate blocks. So first you have all the uppercase, then the lower in A through Z and then all the lowercase a through z and they were not interspersed and this was an important decision um, because it has a huge impact on things like sorting and uh, and other use cases so the first ASCII implementation in 1960 was uh, providing only for seven bits which already looked like a huge improvement coming from five or six bit character sets and so when you look at seven when you have seven bits you can only represent 128 printable characters Later on, an extended ASCII standard was oh, this, the standard was revised and called the extended ASCII with eight bits. And eight bits allows for the 128 characters printable and also um, graphical uh, characters. And as I said, IBM, DEC, GE, and Radeon were early adopters of the ASCII standards, particularly the DEC. Um, they were always ASCII and uh, strong believers in ASCII and even IBM was one of the co-signers of the of the standard when it was created now 
One big difference between the other computer manufacturers, and by the way, GE sounds maybe weird here, but GE and Radeon were computer manufacturers in the 50s and 60s and into the 70s. So they were competitors to IBM at the time. Um, so I was here. So IBM, differently than the other manufacturers, were building computer architectures by purpose field. So computing, if you know, calculations was was an important field, they would build one computer architecture just for that. And then they would build a different computer architecture for business uh, computing and the other one, and maybe another architecture for accounting. And those were all completely uh, different architectures, not compatible within uh, themselves. And even within the product family, sometimes they wouldn't be compatible. And each computer has its, had its own character set. Then um, a very significant mainframe, the IBM 7094, which itself was born from a product family that was um, the 7090 and the 709. Finally, they were roughly compatible with, it, with, with each other, but not fully. And, um, and this computer, which was very important in the early days of the space program, the Gemini program and the Mercury program were all um, followed by IBM 7094 mainframes out of Houston, Texas, and also in, in Massachusetts, in Boston. And only uh, later the S360 was used um, for the Apollo 11 moon program. But anyway, so um, this computer existed from the 50s into the 60s. It was mainly a scientific program, but was also used for early time sharing operating systems, uh, such as uh, the one um, uh, written by Professor uh, Corbardo in, uh, at, at uh, the MIT. And so this was a 36-bit computer. Now, uh, well, we need to understand one thing. Why is it computers 36-bit or 18-bit? Sometimes we see still old uh, computers. And that has something to do with the decision early on to use binary arithmetic for computers if you you know if we if we were using why you know we, we as humans we have 10 fingers usually and we used to count things in by the power of 10 and so why were computers not using the the uh, the uh, the system of 10 for arithmetic why were they using two well there has something to do that in the early computers um, computers were not rely were, were not able to reliably represent 10 digits by 10 voltage levels because you would have to differentiate 10 voltage levels in a single computer and that is difficult to achieve so they were they decided to use the binary system because then you could use only two voltage voltage levels and that is much easier to represent uh, electrically and electronically but that also means that you would need uh, the the log 2 of 10 more uh, electronic components to represent a a, uh, uh, 10 digits because now you have you have only binary but you represent still 10 numbers so um, so there is a there is a limit between the complexity that this law gives you how many more binary circuits or how many more electronic circuits you need to represent a number 10 digits with a binary system and still have significant um, precision for calculation so they decided on 36 bit which would be which would give uh, precise enough uh, calculations. And so within this 36 bit, they decided to use a 6 bit BCD uh, character set. And that's the, and for a long time on IBM computers, they were using um, the BCD character set. Now, IBM also released, as I mentioned, a purpose-built computer or architecture called the IBM 1401. And the 1401 was targeted at business reporting and accounting. And so uh, this computer was radically different. It was released in 1959 with a six-bit word size. And in fact, it had a variable word size. So variable word size computers existed back then. Nowadays, they're almost extinct. And, um, and they were mainly targeting numbers because this was an accounting machine. And also, they wanted to be able to represent punch cards, encoding, 
in the alphabet. So the 6-bit was able to represent both numbers and the punch card character set. And that's why this was, um, this was used by IBM. As you can see here, the, the character set um, with 6-bit was a very simple one. Obviously, you would have as currency at the time, you would only have the dollar, <laughs> all the other currencies. Sometimes you would see computers in France using dollars for the French francs or stuff like that, because that's all those computers were able to represent. And as you can see here, the space again is at the beginning. And you would have um, this encoding here with only uppercase numbers and very few special characters. The IBM, the BCT character set, which was not only used by IBM, but some other manufacturers as well, was not standardized. Um, sometimes even within the same manufacturer, like within IBM, certain peripherals were using slightly different BCD character sets. So, uh, and that was sometimes on purpose because some prints were only used for, let's say, for accounting records and some others maybe for slightly different purposes, but they were not all they were not all automatically compatible. Um, sorry, this is a mistake. No lowercase. It says no uppercase, but it's meant to say no lowercase and no special characters. It only had one currency, no math symbols at all. And then in 1964, IBM announced the S360 architecture, which for the first time, uh, the big thing with the S360 was that one computer for all use cases, accounting, uh, scientific calculations, um, business, and that's why it's called 360 because it's like a, a circle. And, um, and the big innovation with the S360 among some others was that IBM decided to use an 8-bit byte. The word byte existed already before the S360, but it had different meanings. It could be a byte, could be 16-bit, or it could be 36-bit, but IBM started to call the byte something that was representing eight binary digits, eight bits, and so uh, this was the big innovation with the S360, and the 8-bit byte, <laughs> so a byte consisting of eight bits, was quickly adopted by the rest of the computing industry, and to this day, when we say a byte, we mean a, an entity with eight digital bits, which of course is able to represent 256 possible characters. Now, when IBM announced uh, the S360, they announced the machine able to process two character sets, the ASCII code and the EPSIDIC code. By the way, I, I don't think I've said what EPSIDIC stands for. So BCD that we've seen before stands for binary coded uh, decimal. So as you can see here, uh, being able to represent decimals was still a main concern. And then of course, EPSIDIC means extended binary coded decimal interchange code. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, the, the early S360 architecture was able to process both EPSIDIC and ASCII. And sometimes you still see people uh, saying in forums and other places that uh, IBM mainframes can do both. Yeah, they were able to do both, and uh, we'll see later. Linux on the mainframe is ASCII only, but today's mainframes on with the ZOS operating systems and others can only do EPSIDIC. So, but there was a bit in the program status word of the S360, which stood for which turned on USA ASCII, and this bit meant that um, signs would have a nibble, which is half a byte, um, change the the sign the 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 sign for plus and minus, so they would be compatible uh, with ASCII, and um, and this of course is important for the unpacked uh, zone decimal format, which exists on the mainframe, and so this would enable it for because those were reversed, and so this would enable the mainframe to have re properly represent the um, the minus and plus signs in in um, in ASCII if the application needed that. Um, so on the S three seventy architecture, the IBM decided to remove ASCII and so it became only EPSIDIC. So from S three seventy on, 
no ASCII was pro provided anymore in the operating system and in the architecture indeed. So here is how the EPSIDIC table looks like in principle. When I say in principle is because obviously it's more complicated than that. You have a digit representation here or a nibble and again a nibble is a half a byte, four bits and you have four bits representing the zone and by using the zone and the digits as we will see in a while you're able to represent the character that you want to use. So as you can see the EPSIDIC um, format or the character set has now much improved uh, special characters such as parentheses, brackets, still only one currency. You see we have now lower cap and we see we have uh, upper cap and and as you can see there's a lot of white space here so there's a lot of special empty fields here and here um, which were at the time when EPSIDIC was announced were not used and then you have some other special fields which had meanings within the mainframe world such as uh, delete and and other end of tape some special characters which were only needed or uh, function key um, which were needed for um, communication transmissions and and uh, relating to peripherals but they're not printable characters the ones here this ones are printable this ones are printable and this ones are printable so for instance you know we were used to uh, when we work with linux we have the pipe symbol there is no such character as you can see here um, already we start to see that certain characters that we would need in today's world they did not exist in the EPSIDIC table. Now again how to use the EPSIC table, table is that we have, remember we have the zone field here and the digit uh, nibble how is this used? So the computer takes the zone field and adds to it the digit nibble so 1000 0001 results to lower cap a let's check that one zero 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 on the left of the left side of the byte and remember that uh, s360 is a big endian machine so and uh, and then we take the digit and the zone plus the digit results in lower cap a and if we take one one zero zero and then zero 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 one for the digit we get uh, uppercase a so you can see here and there were obviously there is some thinking behind it so they're aligned so that even though they're not interspersed the lower cap and the and the upper case um, they do have the same digit system okay lower j and upper are both 0001 so there's some thinking that goes into it which actually accelerates a lot of the computation needed so EPSIDIC was introduced 1963 with the, as I said, with the S360 architecture, but it has been significantly improved, expanded, enhanced since 1963. We have six different versions until today, each adding more and more characters and sometimes removing some that are not used anymore. And so um, again, EPSIDIC stands for extended binary coded decimal interchange code. So binary coded decimal is where the beginning of it is extended because it added a uh, lower cap etc now um, it's an 8-bit character set so it fits comfortably within a byte um, and IBM decided to go even though it supported the ASCII standard decided to go with EPSIDIC because it already had BCD peripherals in the market and um, here's one important thing to understand is when IBM announced the S360 they needed a, a printer a fast printer and they now and they took the printer from the 1401 uh, computer that already existed since 1959 and was hugely popular in the US and also very much so in Europe and so there were there were at the time many dozens of thousands of 1403 printers in the market and IBM didn't want to go and and there was a reliable good printer and people liked it and so IBM didn't want to uh, go and develop a whole new printer so when they announced the S360 they made the 1403 be compatible with the S360 and the same for the card punch and card read and collators etc so the IBM decided, even though they were supporting the ASCII standard formation, they decided to use the BCD peripherals. And BCD fits obviously within EPSIDIC. 
and that's why IBM used the EPSD code. But the 1403 printer and the car punch and car reader was were an important, and they needed to go to market quickly, and they were already delayed, and other people were already offering new computers, and DEC was already in the scene, and so they felt some pressure, and they decided to go with the BCD uh, character set. Now, why is why is this such a fundamental issue to this day between EPSDIC and Unicode and, and ASCII? And one of the main reasons is that sorting is affected by the character set. Obviously, if you sort millions of records, you need to know how they were encoded, obviously. So as you can see here, um, first you have lowercase characters here in the EPSDIC. You can see here at the glance where the where the problem is. So Epsidic has first lowercase, uppercase, and then numerals, whereas the ASCII and Unicode approach is to have the, unural, the numerals first, and then the uppercase, and then the lowercase, or here the lowercase come before the uppercase. So you can see here uppercase before lowercase. So this means that they have, a, a, for instance, numerals has a lower numeric value in in the in the table in, in in the representation in ASCII than it has with EPSTIC where it's a much higher um, value. So what this means is if you sort purely by the value of the characters, um, and if you have a record that starts with uh, one two three, uh, it will sort it it will be sorted first in the ASCII system, and it will be sorted later, much later after lowercase and uppercase in the EPSIDIC. So Obviously, sorting is deeply affected by the character set, and uh, and so when you you cannot just take a a, a, a data set sorted in the EPSIDIC system from the mainframe, even if you convert it into ASCII and assume that it's properly sorted for the ASCII or Unicode system, because because it's not. So let's look at that a little bit. So here on the left side we have EPSIDIC, and here we have ASCII. So and by the way, um, somebody at um, at the PDF company, what is it called? Uh, the guys that make the PDF um, uh, reader, Acrobat, um, they they analyzed how many characters can are safely mapped between the can safely be mapped always between the EPSIDIC and the ASCII character sets. And out of two hundred fifty six, they found out that only 64 characters really can be always mapped one-to-one -one between the two character sets. All the others, there's always exceptions and there's always rules they need to follow. And sometimes they depend on the use case. So numbers after the alphabet, whereas here the numbers are before the alphabet. Upper after lowercase, where here's upper case is before lowercase. Um, special cards are sorted by the bit number. Um, especially because it's also sorted by the bit number, but obviously they're in completely different uh, places. So if you had, for instance, a, a record which contains the special character dollar, it would be sorted completely different bet between these two systems. And of course, in collating, you also have big differences there. So this thing is important to understand when you deal with the mainframe that there's very few characters that can can always be mapped, you know, the rule is just, you know, if it's there in position such and such on the ASCII, it will always be in position such and such on the EPSIDIC, and there's few of those. All the others, you would always have to use some kind of rule, some kind of decision making, and some kind of uh, yeah, handling of exceptions. So how does it look today? Today, um, Unicode is on all the mainframe, important mainframe subsystems such as DB2, IMS, and Kix, they're able to handle the Unicode, but obviously there's a mapping. Zilinux is ASCII only, and that's a good thing. So Zilinux on its own does not understand EPSIDIC, even though it's running on a mainframe. And then, uh, but that is, the way ASCII is handled in Zilinux is deeply, deeply <laughs> buried inside Zilinux itself. And then terminals, when you connect with 3270, you will have to somehow deal with something called code pages. Code pages are, as I mentioned before, those rules or a system for mapping from one system, from EPSIDIC to ASCII or from ASCII to EPSIDIC. And, uh, and we're going to look at that a little bit now. So code pages, they map. They're 
I would say almost like a rule engine for mapping between ASCII and EBCDIC and vice versa in a session. So that is a session mapping protocol, applies only for that one session. And uh, code pages exist not only for the mainframe, but Microsoft uses them for their products, SAP, Oracle. They're all somehow concerned with what UTF or ASCII system you're using because they have to deal with a lot of national character sets. Uh, most used code pages are 037. They all have numbers. There's hundreds of them or thousands. And these are the ones that are most widely known to the mainframe world. And um, and they'll be used for terminal upload or download, for FTP. You can even, in FTP, you can tell on the mainframe if you up upload to ZOS or ZVM, which code page you want to use for the upload or download. For Telnet, you can also specify a character page, uh, code page if you connect to um, ZOS, Unix system services, and the same goes for SSH. So here's an example of a code page, a widely used code page 437, which maps um, the characters and, and puts them in, cer in, in certain places. So you can see here, now we're going to start looking at a very special character, which we looked at the beginning of this video, which is um, this character here, which is the PL1 representation for NOT and, and REX also. You have another special one. And then you have some national uh, char characters here. So this is the code page that we use to map from EPSIDIC down to ASCII and vice versa. And what you need to understand is that there's no perfect code page. Not every code page can be used for everything. There's some code pages like 437 and 037 they can be used in 95% of all use cases, but in some, they will make problems. And also depends if you're going from EPSIDIC to ASCII or if you're going from EPSIDIC to Unicode. That's another big difference. So um, now that we've looked at uh, how EPSIDIC came to be and what the history of the character sets are, let's go do and let's go look at how this impacts our daily life. So we have here our terminal session, and let's say that I have this program here which has this expression, um, this condition, sorry, uh, if not zero, if count is not zero, then do the following. Now let's say that I want to download this with, um, with terminal transfer, then I would do something like this. I would call download this program, and if I download it, every, every 3270 emulator will have special options. And if I go here, you can see here that it, it there's a screen code page, which is the code page used just for representing it within the screen, and then one for the and then one for the file transfer. So if we use for instance um, a DOS 437 uh, code page and we download this, we're gonna get something like this. Uh, right, this is not the right one. We're going to get something like this. As you can see here, if count is not zero, look what happened. So let's look here. Okay, if count is not zero, and here's count is not zero. So what is this strange character? I don't even know what this is. Honestly, I've never seen it. So, but if I download it with the right um, code page, right? let's say ANSI 1252, which is one of the Microsoft code pages, I would get a result like this. So it, you know, obviously ASCII and Unicode is able to represent the character here from, from PL1 if we tell it to, right? It's just a graphic, so you know. Obviously, Windows is able to to draw this on the screen, right? Uh, it's able to draw this on the screen if we tell it to. But if you download it with the wrong character page or code page, it will come out something completely different. And so you'll see often that when people um, upload, especially source code in PL1 or Rex uh, or uh, sorted data like business records, they will they will sooner or later encounter some some errors in processing that, and that is always related to the code page. So uh, choosing the right code page, and as I said, uh, there's thousands, you can Google it, uh, is very important in being able to accomplish what we need to do 
on the mainframe or from going from the mainframe to the to the to um, to Unix or Windows and vice versa. Now there's also um, here an article I didn't I just it's such a good article I'm going to leave it exactly as it is on the screen that also shows you how to do file transfer. Well, we just dealt with that, but um, you can also do it in FTP. So when you connect with FTP, you know that we have the quote site command uh, to the uh, when we connect to the ZOS system. And so using the quote site, you can specify which code page you want to use. You can even specify UTF, as I mentioned. There is absolutely Unicode support on the mainframe, but this is the conversion we're going to use from UTF-8 to IBM 037. And so um, being able to understand this and understand which code page, code page we need to use is important to get things accomplished. Uh, also, for instance, you know the same is true when we go from from the Windows world or Unix world to the mainframe. Then um, you know certain things like C and C++ have use certain characters which do not exist on the mainframe, um, and so we need to convert those. And uh, processing business records with COBOL, for instance, also needs to know exactly how. Um, how to do this now uh, there are some you know if you connect to the mainframe you uploaded the file there is a utility on USS on ZOS Unix system services called iConv uh, iConvert which converts you can specify the two character sets and then the source and the destination and we'll, it will do that There's, you can also do this with um, from batch so we can execute this also this utility exists EDC convert and then you can say the you the, the two character sets and uh, run it on a character set on ZOS and it will convert also uh, from uh, from within the batch system so um, you can see here understanding this issues are fundamental in getting real work accomplished on the mainframe or even if just uh, moving uh, stuff like C programs or PL1 programs from one computer to the next and and also you know if you go for instance from uh, I use here Vista 3270 because I like this terminal by Tom Brennan but um, sometimes I also use the X3270 on Linux so you need to understand by default which character sets those terminal emulators are using so if I go here to options you will see that uh, this is using out of the many character sets like Italy Italy has two character sets I didn't even know that and United States CP 37 that's what I like to use because that's compatible with most of the stuff that I do but you need to understand which which um, character sets that you need to use for whatever you do and those for 37 so if I do it like this, then for terminal uploads and downloads, I will have the best compatibility. And setting those is going to be important for you to accomplish something of value when you work with the mainframe. So Rex also uses strange characters, PL1 also, of course, does, and certain other languages. So that's it. If you have any questions about EPSIDIC, about conversions between EPSIDIC, how to get uh, some data sets converted on the mainframe, how to work with uh, the ZOS Unix system services or with Linux. then please post them as comments below this video. I hope that uh, we were able to shed some light on this uh, dark and mysterious subject of uh, character sets, which uh, a lot of people don't want to bother with too much, but as we've seen, we need to uh, understand some of that because it's important. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. If you like this video, please press on the thumbs up button and see you soon again in this channel. Goodbye.